So what I want to talk about is, is hopefully a bit entertaining, but a serious subject. And it's a subject about the importance of music in human life and how that relates to its current importance in education and in medicine and in therapy. So we know that music is a universal attribute. So is language. They're found in every population, in every corner of the globe. It's, music is a key form of social communication. It's used in ceremony and ritual. Um, we know that it's actually processed in a very characteristic way within the brain, and I'll show some pictures of that. I'm sorry about that, and a couple of MRIs just to freshen you up. Uh, so we know that it has a very characteristic neural architecture. It contains emotional content. It's stimulating and arousing. We know that it reduces stress. Uh, we know that it has almost a empathic link to the motor system. So if you listen to music that you like, you'll dance or tap your feet or tap your fingers. And yet, it doesn't really do anything. And there's been huge arguments throughout the years about what the hell is music for. The famous philosopher Steven Pinker described it as auditory cheesecake. It tickles the, the hearing system but has no evolutionary value whatsoever. Because as Ian Cross in Cambridge says, it neither plows, sows, weaves, nor feeds. On the other hand, language is what we use all the time for making plans, for thinking about things, for reasoning, expressing our thoughts and ideas. It's a, it, the main way that we communicate with each other about what we're going to do, how we pass on information. But the important thing is not just between people here, but we also use language to learn from our parents and pass on new information to our children who pass it on and so on and so forth. It's a very special feature of, of our species. And for many uh, people, it's language that was a key part of how we evolved the modern cognitive mind, which is something that we possess that's pretty special in the species. Now, I haven't got time to go into um, all the evolutionary issues that I, in a book that I published recently um, uh, uh, to talk about where these two strands came from, music and language. What I can say is though that um, we know from uh, genetic analysis of both the Y chromosome from males and the mitochondrial DNA from females, good, good evidence to suggest that our species emerged somewhere in uh, Oh, I knew that was going to happen. Somewhere in uh, southeastern Africa, around about 80 to 90,000 years ago. And as this diagram shows, um, the last great migration of modern Homo sapiens out of Africa occurred probably somewhere between 65 and 75,000 years ago. What's important about that is that as this, and every single human being outside of Africa carries a particular haplotype of mitochondrial DNA that derives from that initial egress out of Africa about four and a half, four thousand generations ago. Now what's important to, just to remember is that at that time, the most simplest explanation is that those early members of our, our species had both music and language as communication channels. We had both systems already that long ago and we've retained them. So we developed a language communication system and a musical communication system, probably from a precursor, probably from, from a shared precursor that the um, the Neanderthals had here. I don't know anyone read music that says na 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 na. Um, and of course, Neanderthals had very uh, interesting communication systems, probably. So, for example, if I go, or I go, I don't need to use any language for you to understand the difference in the in the impact of that that communication. So you don't necessarily need articulate speech to communicate uh, emotion or intent. But we have developed this new system, but alongside that new articulate speech system that we have, we also have uh, music. In fact, the earliest known musical instruments 
that are clearly musical instruments are at least 43,000. In fact, there's some evidence now they may be as old as 50,000 years old. So that's very, very soon after humans left Africa to populate the world. Now, of course, you're all medical students, so I don't need to describe uh, the neuroscience of the hearing system, do I, to anybody? Of course, you know this backwards. Um, uh, but I'll just m make the comment that um, within the cochlea, which is where we process sound, um, the membrane that on which the receptors sit, the bacillar membrane, is already coded for frequency. So at the very periphery, we have a coding for different frequencies from high to low frequencies that is carried all the way up into the brain to the primary cortical processing area for sound, which is in the temporal cortex. That's not unique to humans. That's found in all mammalian species. But what is interesting about humans is the advanced specialization that we have for processing language on the one hand and speech on the other. So for most left, uh, right-handers, speech is primarily focused in the left hemisphere, which is why it's called the dominant hemisphere, because it's the one that's used for speech communication. Lang uh, music, on the other hand, is primarily across to the right-hand side. It's not a, a complete difference, but it's a fairly strong bias. Uh, things like pitch and melody are mostly on the right-hand side. Harmony and timbre. Timbre means, for example, the ability to distinguish the sound of a, an oboe from a clarinet or a female voice from a male voice. Um, again, that tends to be on the right-hand side. Rhythm, beat, meter are a little bit more complex in the way they're processed. But it's a very characteristic uh, network of, of signaling. So up here you can see, for example, uh, an MRI, a functional MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, where they look at the oxygenation of the blood, tells you how active an area of the brain is. And you can see here's the front, here's the back. And on this, this is the right-hand side. And you can see there's an emphasis, for example, in rhythm towards the right-hand side. If you look down here with uh, an an analyzing pitch, a non-musician, again, there's a bias to the right-hand side, but a trained musician tends to shift across to the left. So any of you people who play the piano or the violin or have done a fair bit of music training, your musical uh, circuits will have shifted a little bit to, to the left-hand side. But music also is important in memory and emotional responses, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. So, there's a very clear circuitry, and it's important to understand that. Now, a few months ago, I gave a TED talk uh, at, at the concert hall, and I couldn't afford to get an MRI machine on the stage. Uh, it was just a bit too heavy. Um, so what we did, actually, was to... I had a, a colleague of mine to hook up to an EEG machine live on the stage uh, to show how the brain responds to uh, different types of musical uh, signal in a very characteristic way, to show how special uh, music can Im Im input the brain. So what I want to do is to show you uh, this little clip um, from that TED talk to, so that you can see what we tried to do. And I'd like what I want to do now is to show you the power of music, showing how music can change the way we view the world. What I'm showing you here is a picture in silence so that you can get a feel for this visual image. Just watch. Now, I'm going to ask these wonderful members of the Perth Symphony Orchestra to play a piece of music, see how you feel about it this time. Watch it again, but with this accompaniment. <coughs> It 
It was quite pretty the second time round, wasn't it? <laughs> no wonder music is so important in the movies. Now, science and technology has given us things like magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, which has given us a huge new way of looking at the way music is processed in our brains. Unfortunately, I couldn't get an MRI on the stage with me here today. <laughs> so we're going to use another method to look live at how the brain is affected by music. And this is using electroencephalography, or EEG. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, fellow neuroscientist and musician, Andrew Price. <clears throat> And you can see he's got an interesting cap on his head. This is full of electrodes that are designed to pick up electrical activity that's going on inside his brain from different regions. So essentially what we have here is a window looking at the electrical signals that's zapping around inside his head. What we're going to do is to see how his brainwave activity changes as different sorts of music are being played. So first of all, we're going to ask Andrew to close his eyes so that the visual stimulus is removed and he can focus more on what he's listening to. And now we're going to play uh, different sorts of music to see how that impacts upon him. These are alpha waves synchronized activity he is at peace he loves this peace it's really calm he loves it. I don't know, there was a change there for sure. <laughs> the other thing is, when you listen to a piece of music that you expect, you know, uh, part of the fun is expecting something to happen. What happens when the unexpected happens? Well, I mean, you know. So, music has all sorts of expectations, and it has a very important emotional impact on, on us. Uh, this, this diagram shows the limbic system containing uh, the structures involved in uh, emotional responses and in also in formulating uh, new memories and music has a gold pass into that structure in a way that language doesn't so it is able to have an impact on uh, a number of these structures that are we know are very important in memory and I'll come back to that a little bit later now what um, that means is that the emotional impact that music has, again, is quite different from, from the way we sort of speak to one another, unless we're screaming at each other, of course, and threatening to divorce or, or expose us, the, the, someone's bad behaviour. Uh, but it interacts, music interacts in a remarkable way with other emotional stimuli. And I just